I'll tell you what, Harmy, this is a strange old tournament, you know. It's taking place on two or three continents, eight different countries, places as diverse as Dallas, New York, and and you know, Guyana, for goodness sake. Um, it, the, the start times are varying by 10 hours. It's very hard to keep up, up to date with what's happening wherever you are in the world. Yeah, it is. But before we get on to that, man, as, how was is, how is the Tommy Tourist going? You've been to, I mean, you did. we've just done India with you, and you've been to India about... 19 20 times but how is new york we've had some pictures we'll see you though you've got your you know you've got your sort of i think you know, your folded up hanky on the top of your head and your ice cream in your hand when you're walking through times square how is how is new york and what does that look like i tell you what Hami, the city itself first of all let me just say that um you know when you say that i'm in new york i'm on long island it's a bit like saying that you're in london when you're staying in rickmansworth um it's <laughs> you know I, it's a it's a it's an hour's journey to get into the city new york itself has lived up to every single one of my expectations i have been tommy tourist the first day i was here i was up the empire state building um and you know the uh, just the 9 11 memorial is absolutely staggering the um statue of liberty the ferry to staten island i've i've done as much as i possibly can i've still got the run in central park to come but times square is completely mind blowing um, you know, take take Leicester Square in London and you know give it a shot of steroids. It is mm. it's been it's been incredible, Harmy. But the as for the the do you know the security is is um intimidating and I suppose that is supposed the way it's supposed to be. Um where the teams have been practicing in Long Island uh, is a massive park with um a, an 18 hole golf course tennis courts, basketball courts, a water park for the kids, places to walk the dogs. It's in a huge, huge park, um, which is massively important to the local community in school holidays. And the New York police, NYPD, have shut the entire place. The entire wow. place. There's policemen on every single corner. And when I first went, I approached uh, with my rucksack on my back and the, the policeman had his hand hovering over his gun when I was 50 metres away from him and I was on foot. So, you know, it, it's intimidating. Um, and I think that people are going to find it pretty uncomfortable trying to get into the stadium on match days. But, you know, there was supposedly a terrorist threat before the first game. And maybe that's just the world we live in. But you do get the impression that the police are protecting something that they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, and also it's it's obviously it's something new to them. It's you were saying they don't understand the you know, and how the ICC gone with that because I would imagine over the course of the last two years, building up to this, there have been directives of yeah you know, security of you know Reg Dickinson, somebody I know really really well working with England. Uh, are they working with the police or is it no nah, no nah, you're in our city you do what we say. There has, at this stage, Harmy, and I've heard this from, I've corroborated it from three different sources, there has been no collaboration at all between mm. the NYPD and the ICC. None at all. The ICC were doing their thing, and they are a pretty good events uh, company, but in terms of accreditation and protocols that they have established over the course of many years, and of course they did it in India just last year, uh, for the 50 over World Cup, but uh, the the NYPD and and the states ha are just not listening. Just not. This is how we do it, and um, and the ICC uh, organising staff have been um, have been quite stressed <laughs> to put it to put it very mildly. I mean, I'm you know I'm a couple of hours away from going to the South Africa Sri Lanka game, and I'm intimidated. We'll record the section after the game. And I'll let you know exactly how it was trying to get into the stadium. But um, all indications are that it's going to be quite stressful. So um, we'll we'll crack on, and I'll uh, we'll talk about the South Africa Sri Lanka game. Um, what have we? What have you? How much have you seen of the tournament so far? As I said, um, the start times are <laughs> all over the place. Uh, basically, uh, to maximise the revenue from the Indian television audience. But the the, the opening game between. Um, the the states in Canada was an absolute cracker. Not sure if you if you saw that. And in England's group, Namibia and Oman, I thought was a complete thriller. 
you know, 109 plays 109 decided by a super over. David Visa was in- unbelievable. <laughs> he scored the runs and then bowled the super over himself. Um, and, you know, people will laugh and say, oh, 109 plays 109. But it doesn't matter. It's like on the golf course. The only thing that matters is Colonel Par, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you beat your mate with an 87 uh, and he shot 88, it's still a thriller. Exactly. You win the hole with seven. Who cares what number it goes on the scorecard? And look, do you know what? Some of them games, some of them games, some of them 110 players, 110, you know, they're better games than 200 players, 180. Uh, they, they give you a you know, a good contest between bat and ball. I don't think it was a great contest between bat and ball in, in the Namibia the Namibia Man game, but I thought the, the, the USA-Canada game was very, very good. I watched... I watched probably more of the West Indies game when they played Papua New Guinea the other day. Uh, I was very surprised that I didn't think there was many in it in Guyana. I didn't think the crowd was that big for a, a tournament with the West Indies where you think, you know what, they've got a chance here, the West Indies. So, um, look, first couple of weeks is going to be, or first week or so is going to be a little bit of a, of a not of a non-starter, but a, 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 a little sample size of what the rest of the tournament's going to be. Um, I was at the Oval on um, Thursday night and watched, I thought, that first six overs, the man is the other night, was just, I mean, it was palpable. You know, Archie was bowling at 91 mile an hour, Wood was bowling at 95 mile an hour, and Babar Azam just kept hitting him through mid-wicket for four on the up. Bang, thank you very much for seeing that. But I was stuck with Goffey, you know, we were, we were doing the green room, and me and Goffey were sitting there going, these lose a wicket. At the end of power play, I was 65 for... 65 for none off six. End of power play. And me and Goffey are going, if Baba gets out here, they won't get 140. You know, we just, we was like, we, they'll not get 140. You know, England, England's pace attack, their spin bowlers. Um, I was really impressed by the way England, I mean, m- more than, su- not not surprised, pleasantly surprised about the way England have gone about their work because I didn't, I, I thought England might struggle in this tournament. But actually now, after watching them over the last sort of two games in England, I actually think they might have a, a bit of a sniff and a bit of a chance, especially if they play the two fast lads. If Archer and Wood play in the in the business end of this tournament together, and I thought Jordan looked good, I think England might have a chance. All right, let's um, move on to the England camp. Do you remember a couple of years ago, we were talking... It seemed during the Vitality Blast all the time about Phil Salt and the lack of recognition that he was receiving. Yeah. Um, and now, suddenly, two years later, he's, um, I don't know, first sort of first half dozen names on the team list um, at the top of the order. Um, and he was talking a little bit earlier. I watched the final year in 2010, and, you know, that was pretty special. It's the stuff you dream of as a kid. So to be back here and have the opportunity to play for England in a World Cup is, is, isn't is something I ever thought I'd be doing, but certainly very special. And, you know, I think every kid in the crowd would have gone, that's going to be me one day, or I'd like that to be me one day, but you never believe it. So now to be here in an England shirt, you know, with the opportunity to do something special in the next month is is, is incredible, really. That was Phil, to- Phil Salt uh, at a press conference a little bit earlier today. Uh, Harmy, um, I, I guess it was just that there was no place for him. I mean, I, I suppose he was being noticed and, and recognised, but, you know, <laughs> with Jason Roy and... I mean, there was just... There there wasn't a place for him, and, and that's why he wasn't mentioned. Um, but uh, he's, uh, he's... He's grabbed his chance with both hands for Kolkata Knight Riders, but has he done it with England? Or is, is this his chance to make himself a permanent fixture? I think I think he's done it. I think in the Caribbean, I think he went, you know what? No question on my place at the top of the order now. This is my this is my spot. He had to wait a long time. <laughs> Funny enough, man, as on Friday night, I came back and commentated on Durham versus Warwickshire. Another invisible man was playing in that game because Sam Hain was back from fitness. He was playing in that game. And I've actually got out to the middle to say, look, me and Manners would love to have a chat with you. Um, but you look at somebody like Phil Saw, I think in the Caribbean, I think he put all the the sort of Alex Hills, Jason Roy stuff to bed, and I think, and then gone to the IPL and then cemented his place. So I'd like to think this is his coming of age of tournament wise, tournament player, um, because I think he's probably is one of the, the first names on the team sheet at the top of the order. So that's good to see. He's going back to a familiar place because obviously he was born in Barbados. Or he's played, he's, he's, he was brought up in, you know, for 
a lot of time in Barbados. So that's going to be good for him. Um, and you you look down the list, he's, he's you know, the, the, the likes of Butler and Best, oh, and Jax is a top four. I think what Jax has done in the IPL as well is is given him a little bit of a confidence boost. So I think it might be Phil. I think Phil Salt is concrete nail bang on this team. I think Will Jax is trying to cement his place in this team. So from that point of view, I think, you know, hopefully they both take their chance the way they have been going so far in domestic or in franchise tournaments. And if they do, then England stand a great chance because getting off to a start in these games, um, I think the way as the tournament goes on, the wickets get a bit more tired. It's going to be, I think there's going to be more onus on that one, two, three and four in that first six overs. And the teams that have the best power players will probably predominantly go on and win it. Army, just before we finish this section, um, the big game, is obviously Australia. I mean, it would be the biggest shock in the history of cricket if England and Australia don't get out of this group with Scotland, Oman and Namibia as the other teams. But will Matthew Mott use those games against lesser teams to make sure that all of his squad get a game? I mean, will there be some rotation or is he just going to stick to the best 11 throughout? Do you know what? I'd, there'll, be, there'll be no rotation top order. I don't think there'll be any rotation batting order. I think top six will stay the top six. Um, you know, we just mentioned four of them. You know, Butler, Salt, Jackson, and Best will be four. Brooke will be five, and then it'll be. I think Livingston will will play at six, and the only sort of switch will possibly be that well, Moen might go up above him if they need a left-handed option in that in that sort of top six. So that for me will be their top seven. The only rotation possibly would be if England decide that their best option is to play the two fast lads and play Wood and Archer, you might have to have a little rotation because natural you know, wear and tear on their bodies. And you've also got to remember, you've got to look after Joffre a little bit. So I think in an ideal world, I think all fitness, all firing, they'll play the majority of cricket. I think, but I think they'll get them like a prime resource ready for that Australia game, then the Super 8s, and then hopefully the knockout stages where I think England's best 11 was one that we seen against Pakistan at the Oval the other night. You know, Rashid at 10, three three bowlers of of Wood, Archer and Jordan. By the way, I tell you what, Chris Jordan looks a lot fitter, a lot stronger than I think he's he's ever been. And um, I, I wonder if he's the, the little sort of elbow injury he's carried in the last sort of 18 months has been given a bit of a rest, got himself in a position to strengthen that because he had a yard of pace quicker than he was the other night. And he's and we know what he's like at the death. So if he's bowling at 85, 88 mile an hour, uh, what a proposition of attack we've got if we play Wood Archer and Jordan. So they might rotate because of body, but I think if they're good to go, like Owen Morgan used to do, I think Josh Butler will try and keep the same side as much as he possibly can for continuity and try and, you know, I would try and blow the tournament away. Just one thing to point out, uh, unlike many fast bowlers that in other countries, um, you know, with an over to go, if you had Mark Wood and Joffrey Archer walking to the crease, you wouldn't be unhappy, to be honest. I mean, they're both really good hitters of the ball as well. So, you know, it's not a problem. Not like uh, either of them is a rabbit. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And next up, we'll continue to look ahead to, to some of the big games coming up and we'll have that reaction to uh, the opening game in New York between South Africa and Sri Lanka. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. And a reminder, you can now watch us on YouTube. Just head over to the TalkSport Cricket YouTube channel and uh, subscribe. All right, let's get into some of the action, uh, Harmi. Um, West Indies and a thriller against uh, Papua New Guinea. Well, it was briefly thrilling. Uh, the West Indies looked nervous to me, and that's understandable. <laughs> they are co-hosts. It wasn't a big to target they were chasing. 136 against Papua New Guinea, but uh, they needed Roston Chase's cool head at the end to get them across the line. Um, they might, I suppose, um, come to regret if net run rate hurts them, because they do have uh, Afghanistan and New Zealand in their group. Um, but, you know, the win comes first over net run rate, doesn't it? And we'll we'll talk also about uh, South Africa, Sri Lanka. <laughs> oh, well, we'll come to that in a moment. Any thoughts on the West Indies Papua New Guinea game? Well, the West Ind I thought the West Indies actually were going for the net run rate and then realised that 
ah, we meet, might need just to get over the line here. I think they were, I think they were going for it. I think it was, it was a small total. Let's have a go. Let's have a crack. And I think the wicket had a little bit more in it than the West Indies was hoping for. Uh, and Papua New Guinea bowled quite well in that power play. So, yes, it was a good win for you know the co-hosts. Um, but I want to know what New York was like, man. As you said, you know this is going to be something that you've never experienced. Um, the game was not very good, to be fair. But how was the experience of New York? You know, Eisenhower Park getting into the ground. You know what the atmosphere was like. There wasn't as many people as that was going to be for India Pakistan. But just give us a sample of of your ex- your your massive experience of following cricket around the world in a new place. <laughs> Tommy, I mean, you know you got you know I was trepidatious, don't you? You know that yeah. I, I was nervous. Well, uh, the actual experience exceeded every single one of my worst nightmares. This is my fifteenth or sixteenth World Cup in the various formats, and I have never ever experienced something um, as awful as as it was today. I, I I'm staying in a room twenty minutes walk from the stadium, and it took me an hour and forty five minutes to get in i was uh directed left right the in whole of eisenhower park is is shut down the, the fans have to walk two kilometers um and nobody seemed to know where the media needed to go and it was intimidating as hell mm. army honestly it's like a war zone there are combat troops with military assault rifles and they are intimidating as heck um, and the, as I said, they're not working with the ICC. It was just ex- exceptionally, exceptionally difficult to get uh, into the venue. And I'm so nervous. I'm going to start talking in a low, low voice now, <laughs> just in case <laughs> I get thrown out and I can never come back. But but honestly, I hope things uh, smooth out. Um, do you know, as I finally got through the third um, defence um, checkpoint, I say <laughs> defence, mm. I got through the first checkpoint and suddenly... Um, the most raucous scream instruction to me because I was dragging my laptop bag, you know the one. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, so I thought I'm finally in here. I've been through body searches and the scanners and X-rays, and I thought, right, I'm finally in. It's been an hour and forty minutes. I'm drenched in sweat, and suddenly this officer bellowing at me, "Leave that bag!" And so I, I was. It was terrifying. I was shaking. I had to walk away from my laptop bag. He called the canine officer over with this Alsatian that was the size of a wolf. And they came and <laughs> sniffed my bag. And uh, finally, that was uh, the last. I mean, I was shaking for, for 20 minutes um, when I once I finally got into the press box. Do you know what? I'm not, it's just not, um, I'm not moaning and complaining. I'm just telling you as it, as it is. And if it, if it helps to, to prevent a terrorist attack, then you know what, <laughs> if that's what we have to do, as I said to you earlier, if that's the world we live in, then that's the world we live in. Um, to, be, but, uh, to, be, to be fair, man, is I think Scott Taylor, our producer, who's you know, our great producer, who's, um, who's listening to this show and making sure we're doing the right things, and Andrew McKenna, who will probably will be listening as well, who sampled our tour to uh, India, would not be surprised if people are shouting at you, Neil Manthorpe, because dragging your bag, being 10 yards behind everybody else, and in a world of your own, is the norm for you. But you must, you know, I must have felt, you know, what on earth am I doing here? Yeah, well, I'm here. And uh, as I said, the um, the, <laughs> the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty and Times Square and everything else has been absolutely fabulous. I've had an incredible <laughs> life experience. And this has just added to it. I just hope that, I mean, the India-Pakistan game is coming up here uh, yeah. on the 9th. Um, and I, honestly, there was a crowd of twelve and a half thousand today. Uh, that game is going to see thirty-five thousand people, yeah. and uh, I just really, really desperately hope that it's uh, incident-free. On to the game, Harmy. Um, do, do you know what? Do you remember when when new wickets are laid at club grounds or county grounds? When a new wicket is laid or half of the square is relayed, I I always remember the groundsman saying, "It won't be ready for a year." Um, you yeah. know, you've got to, you play a couple of second eleven games on it. Um, you play a few club games on it. You let the wicket settle. Well, this game today was played on a wicket that's never had a single ball bowled on it. Mm. It's just being grown, 
and um you know and it was spicy we spoke to Ulrich Norkia who took career best figures of four for seven I mean he looked like a school ground bully didn't he really bowling bouncer after bouncer to the Sri Lankan batsman and he said afterwards rather pithily uh, correct me if I'm wrong but you don't need 26s in every game for it to be a yeah. good game and he, this is really interesting. When Indu Hasaranga, the Sri Lanka captain, said we batted poorly, he didn't have any complaints. It wasn't it wasn't a fair contest between bat and ball. But as Nokia said, you know, we're allowed some assistance as well. We're allowed our days. It rarely happens. Mostly it's a flat pitch and it's the it's the it's the batsman's uh, game. But Hasaranga said if we'd played proper cricket shots, we could have scored 120 and made a good game of it. So you know, they it was interesting. I mean, it was it was up and down, mostly up. Uh, very quick, very bouncy. You'd have loved it. Loved it, yeah. I would. I was watching it in Nokia. I was pleased for Henrik Nokia. I like Nokia, as you know. We like I like fast bowlers. Um, and you know, to see Nokia run in, who's had a troubled time in you know the the recent six months, eight months. He's been questioned whether he's placed, questioned the IPL, whether he's going to be even in the South Africa squad. So you're right. He is right. You know, it's. It's great when sixes are getting it's raining sixes every now and again, but a low game like the Namibia game the other night that's a fantastic game of cricket when the super over. This one again, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the Indian batters are going to be, you know, quite happy with uh, with facing Shine Shah Freedy on that or Harris Ralph. Um, likewise, Babar Azam facing Jasper Bumra. So I think you know the experiment of going to New York will work. I think because of the crowd and the atmosphere and everything that's going. But I think first impressions of that surface. Not sure the batters are going to be too keen on putting New York in their passports in the foreseeable future. If this is the wicket that they're going on, it just looked like a club ground, a club wicket. It looked like a, a proper club wicket you'd find up in the northeast when we played first class cricket. The lights of Gates had fell and Darlington and. Hartlepool and Stockton. When you go to these festival grounds at like of Beckenham and and you know we when you play at Cheltenham or you play at um, yeah, where is it the Maidstone down in in Kent, you know these club grounds have tennis ball bounce and this one looked as though it wasn't really that fun for batting if you had a bowl of more than eighty five miles an hour. So I think watch the space on that one. If Sri Lanka, I was surprised the toss. I really was surprised at the toss. I thought Hasaranga, I thought the team bowling first would have been the option, um, especially on a new wicket. Um, but give credit to South Africa. You know, they went in and then they did not go and do what the West Indies did and go for the, the net run rate. It was like, yeah, let's just get over the line here and move on because we are, I don't think this is going to be fun for batting on. So I think first impressions of Eisenhower Park is you get 140 batting first you're in the game, really in the game, especially where the bowlers that are on show. So I think there's a few bowlers around the world coming into Eisenhower Park going, licking their lips and going, right, it's my turn now. I've been whacked all around India. I've been whacked all around franchise cricket. Pick some of that, you batters. Um, and I don't mind that at all. Yeah, quite right. Um, I promise you, on the, June the 9th, there will be arrests. I mean, there's always a little bit of aggro, isn't there, when an uh, India-Pakistan game. 99% of the time, it's a, it's a festival of uh, of co competition, um, but uh, there is always a little bit of aggro. I promise you, Harmi. And you you know me. I mean, I mm. have um, been been known to, to be forthright um, with uh, security staff who won't let me uh, in the ground to do my job, but I kept very, very quiet. Anyway, let's um, put that to one side now and very quickly talk about Major League Cricket. It's been like, granted List A status. Um, so in the first year of Major League Cricket, your record in, in the T20s didn't count, didn't go on your official record. That has now been corrected. And there's informed talk of the M MLC expanding from six to 10 teams. So lots and lots of talk about the growth of the game in the United States, I, I must be honest that you know after four or five days here, I, I, I find it quite difficult to to imagine. Um, there's a talk about a large uh, immigrant or now native community from the subcontinent, but there's, there's only there's only four and a half million. Um, you know, in a country of three hundred and seventy million, I still would uh, would uh, tell you that uh, from my experience and all the people that I've spoken to outside of the stadium, they've never heard of cricket apart from the one that 
that makes a noise in your garden. Yeah, and then, and I hope it's the, it's about and I think the the importance of um, MLC getting uh, list day status is huge because then that's going to attract. Yeah, you know, well. Uh, I say I, I'm very good at sounding stupid, but <laughs> it's not going to it's not going to attract players to come even more because money does. But having the the sort of the numbers on your stats, and I think that will will be a, another encouragement for players to come over to the MLC. They'll get financially rewarded if it goes to ten teams. The Silicon Valley, you know, big wigs are are throwing money at um, MLC. We heard that firsthand. Last year, from the San Francisco owner, who spoke brilliantly to us, we'll hear it again a little bit more in a couple of weeks' time. Liam Plunkett's going to come back on, you know, halfway through the the World T Twenty and talk about the MLC, which is probably going to be his last tournament. Um, I think that's here to stay, and I think even if it is just four and a half million people from um, from overseas coming in and buying into what the American dream is, that four and a half million with the financial backing that it could get from the Indian uh, franchise owners, that could turn into 10 million, 12 million, 15 million and beyond within a matter of five years. And that is exciting from a cricket fan, exciting for a young cricket player. Um, but I think it could be a, ooh, a little bit of a, a, a bit of anxiousness from the ECB because this MLC is going to happen at the, at the business end of the England so English summer. And that could take a lot of players over, you know, over to uh, to America to play. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, uh, the best thing I think the ECB can do is uh, make sure that plenty of the private investors in the hundred franchises actually have investments in MLC franchises yeah. as well. So they would then will have you know uh, uh, overlapping interests to 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 make sure that they you know that that both tournaments uh, survive and flourish. Uh, that's a story that obviously we'll be following a lot in the coming months and uh, and years, probably. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. Uh, next up in part three, Army has an exclusive interview with uh, former England Test captain Joe Root. All right, let's hear now from uh, former England Test captain Joe Root. A little earlier today, he joined Harmy for an extended chat about Yorkshire scheduling his return to county cricket and a look ahead to the test summer. Yo, thanks for joining us on following on. Um, Mike, what's it been like back playing at, at Headingley, playing at Yorkshire, back playing in county cricket? It seems as though you've um you know, you've you've enjoyed your time. Yeah, I've absolutely loved it. Um it's nice to see Army, it's been a while, but um it's I've absolutely loved it. It's been it's a great group of lads. It's a very different team to what it was a few years ago when I was playing more regularly, but it's a new cha sort of a new challenge for me as a as a senior player coming back into it. It's a slightly different role, but um, and it's been quite. I suppose it's been we feel a bit unfortunate in you know there's six games that we've had, four of them we've been bossing the games and weather's sort of won, and the two where and um, we've managed to get a full result, we've been on the wrong side of it. So it's been a little bit frustrating in that, that regard, but. In terms of being back involved around county game, it's I've really enjoyed that side of it for sure. And Joe Root, what does he look to achieve when he goes back to to playing? Is it just to be that senior player? You you because it's a it's a little bit different to obviously the international cricket from the you know, the crowd and everything that goes with it. What's what are you looking to go back to achieve when you set sort of stall out at the start of the the campaign to say right because for the first test match and playing these games? Yeah, I mean. I think first and foremost, any team you play and you set out to win, don't you? And try and contribute to winning. Uh, I think in that team, as I mentioned, slightly different role, being a more senior player, a lot of experience, trying to pass that on to some of the younger players, if if possible, and if there's any ways that you can help out or offer something, whether it's having a, a few discussions with the batters or um, you know, suggesting a few ideas about how how you want to take 20 wickets whatever it is I think you've just got to offer up as much as you can and try and give as much back as you can to that team um, and then from a performance side of thing you know it's just trying to get out there get in the rhythm of for me batting is a lot about rhythm it's um, try not to be too technical but just try and find that rhythm of the game and um, get that sort of 
consistency with my movements, which I know enables me to go and score big runs. So I managed to do that on a couple of occasions so far this season, which has, I, I guess, put me in a nice place going into the test summer on a on a personal level. It's been a difficult couple of years for, for Yorkshire, both on and off, off the field. Um, there's a lot of very good... Yorkshire will always have very good young players. You know, this, the talent pool that Yorkshire have, have always had, there's always been a conveyor belt of players coming through and going through to England. How enjoyable is it to see, you know, when you have gone back in, that these young, exciting players are are growing sort of week by week, month by month, and year by year? Yeah, I mean, you've been involved. You've seen them. You know how talented they are. There's some really good players. Um, you know, and, and it's not just at Yorkshire either, but it's uh, making sure that you, that the opportunities that are there for them to grow. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the the scheduling as it is, it makes it quite difficult sometimes because they're playing so much cricket. Um, it sort of dilutes the product slightly. Um, but those players, like you mentioned, there's people like George Hill, um, Finley B. Obviously, Brookie's come through now, and he's showing everyone all of his qualities, but done a, a, a hell of a, a lot of hard yards at Yorkshire and beforehand. There's some really good young players there that um, could, could go on to some really special things in the future. So to see it, like to see that development coming back and, you know, trying to help guide that and help that is, it's, it's a really nice um, privilege to have really. You mentioned the schedule. It's, it's been a bit different uh, this this start of the season. You've had two games with a Cookerbra ball. I think you played in one of them. Um, I know Daniel Ben Drummond said on Friday night that he played late Friday night and then faced 85 mile an hour plus on Saturday and he felt tired. You've got, I think you play Lancashire on the 20th, which is probably the closest from a, an atmosphere and emotions point of view to an international game that you'll get in domestic cricket. And then you've got Durham the following day. And then you go into the championship game on the 23rd. Um, that's difficult for anybody, isn't it? It is difficult. Um, you mentioned the Cookerbra ball. I think um, I think that's going to can only be a good thing for in county cricket. Um, you're asking guys to, to learn a completely new skill set and to develop something and, and, and maybe have to think about the game slightly differently, which I think can only be a good thing moving forward. I don't think it'll happen straight away and overnight, but I do think that um, that is something that over a long term, if it's used for a four or five year period, you'll see a progression of, of bowlers be able to de de develop new skills and become better for it. Um, you know, If you ask me, I think there should be less championship games, um, three of which could be, or four of which could be five day games and use a cooker mm -hmm. ball in those games and try and bridge that gap slightly towards test cricket, test cricket uh, and, and still enable a chance for people to get results uh, if the wickets are flat rather than moaning about you no know, one can get a result uh, why don't we find a different way around it and and why don't we try and keep finding ways of upskilling giving batters opportunities to score big runs and learning what it's like to handle scoreboard pressure and allowing spinners to come into the game and try and win your game on day five so or day four in terms of the actual schedule, the amount of cricket that is out there now, it's it makes it very difficult to get, you know, you talk about being able to perform at 100%. You want to be peaking when throughout those four days, you don't want to be going into it tired and or even having a depleted squad because guys are injured because of the amount of cricket they've had to play um, and had to travel in between to get there. Um, with the intensity that you want, if you want to match it or get it as close to the international scene, I think the only way around it, unfortunately, is by having uh, having more rest in between and and giving guys opportunity to to freshen up and and really hit those games hard so that the the standards better, the pace is there, um, and skill level doesn't drop at any side, and you don't get players sort of operating at seventy, eighty percent just to get through and knowing that they've got games around the corner. Um, you know, you, you you spoke about that Lancashire fixture. Yorkshire Lancashire is always an incredible atmosphere. I think it's going to be carnage this year. There's a Euros game on just before in the ground, so it'll be even even more hectic in there. It'll be um, it'll be bouncing, but you know that should be guys going into that should be absolutely um, ready to go at a hundred percent and and not thinking, oh, we've got a game the next day and then we've got a championship game. That shouldn't be part of the thought process. It should be. Well, to the 100 percent 
make it an amazing uh, spectacle for everyone in the ground, everyone watching on the telly. Um, and, you know, think about what's to come around the corner. So I just hope that uh, in time this can get figured out and that I can only the skill level. And if you're looking at it from an international perspective, the quality uh, and everyone performing at that peak level, it, it makes things an easier transition and, and raises the standard for when it comes to moving up and seeing those players there. Joe, you played in the 100. Um, not as many blast. You haven't played much blast games, but you played in the 100. And the 100 talked about being private investment and the, the, the sale of it could be around the corner. Um, is that the county's way out of them saying, well, we can't afford to play less cricket because, you know, the more cricket we need cricket to play to keep our cash flow? Is it important that they get the sale of the 100 right, which then can then filter down to make sure that county's get looked after and the players get looked after in such a way where you're saying the quality is better when less is more. Yeah, I, I think you just have to look at the landscape of international sport or not even international sport, just sport in general. Now, the amount of exposure it gets, um, the amount of money that's having to get pumped into it to produce a level of quality that is desired by people watching it. Uh, it's it's difficult for the county system as it is to cope with that. And I think the only way of us continuing to move forward is for that injection of cash in the game. And, you know, I, I can only see this being a good thing for not just white ball side of cricket, but also for the longevity of red ball cricket in, in our country as well is getting more money in there so that, you know, we can keep, putting out and, and producing the players that we, we desire to have at test level and having a really good quality standard at um, at county county level as well and in first-class cricket. So I, I can't see how it would be a bad thing with, you know, private ownership coming into the game potentially, having having that external investment into into the county setup. You played T Twenty cricket again. Um, how good is that? You've, I think, obviously, captain England for five years. The one thing you probably did sacrifice more than anything else was the white ball element of the game and not playing as much T Twenty cricket. How good is it back in the Yorkshire shirt playing T Twenty, especially with a you know, a Roses match on the horizon? Yeah, it's great. Um, I've really enjoyed getting back into the into the Yorkshire dressing room full stop, but to get the chance to play some T20 cricket is brilliant. Um, you mentioned that and, you know, that's one of the sacrifices that I I made and was, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get the chance to to captain England for such a long period of time and it's um, it was part and parcel of it. But it's great to see that, you know, with me missing out on on certain things, guys coming in and, and raising the bar and taking the game to, to new heights and, and moving it forward, um, it needs to always keep evolving. And it's great to see this England team so powerful, so strong and in such a good place going into a World Cup. Um, from a personal side of things, I've got, I think I've got six to eight games here in the Blast where I, I can dive into some T20 cricket. It's been over a year since I've played it. Um, you know, I've played a few hundred games last year, but by that, it's there's been a long time to get in, into the format. So hopefully it can get some some scores together and help us win some games and get us into a, a good spot in the blast before the um, the test matches come round. Test matches come round. Um, your relationship with Ben, very, very close. How have you made you know, Ben's transition as, as captain? Um, being around being around him for so long. You know, you've 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 been through a hell of a lot with with Ben Stokes. Um, what have you made of, of the transition and everything that's going? Especially, well, there has been a bit of noise about your batting, but when I look at it, you, you, your average is higher, your strike rate's better. And you, can you do any more than average 50? <laughs> uh, I think I, I've got to a stage in my career where I, I know what I want to achieve and I want to score my runs. And um, I think... On a more poignant note, I think Ben's come into this role and, I mean, he's always been a leader in any team that he's played in. Even from being a young lad, he's always led by his actions and how he how he goes about everything from his training to wanting to bowl 10 over spells to wanting to be out there and, and winning the game with the bat and, and taking on those big moments. He's always been the standard bearer in that regard. But the way he's, his vision and the way he sees the game, the way he's been able to... Um, put that into 
the role of of a captain uh, and and get people to follow him and keep people engaged in test cricket and and sort of give a sort of different way of looking at things um i think has been really refreshing i, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea around the world and everyone has their own ideas how to do it but i think what he has done he's recognized the best players in this country him and baz and and Keezy, uh, and thought this is this is how we're going to get the best out of our best players by playing in this way. Um, and you've seen an upward curve in our Test cricket. There's no there's no doubts about it. Is from where we were to where we are now, we look a completely different animal as a Test match team. Um, and that's testament to him and you know all that he's done in in shaping and molding a team that he believes he's going to go on and, and do special things in that format. So I think he's taken to it extremely well. Um, I think it's exciting to watch. It's certainly exciting to play. Um, and even though the, you know, you look at the immediate results that we just had in India, it's such a tough place to go and play. But I do think um, tour on tour, we are developing, we are getting better. Um, and that's a really exciting thing when you think we're what, a year and a half out from it, from an Ashes tour in Australia exciting to, to be able to go there knowing that we're on that upward curve and in, if that continues then we'll be in a really good spot to take them on down in Australia and just finally Joe it's going to be it's going to be a good summer I think the West Indies are a, I think they've got an excellent bowling attack to come first up Sri Lanka after that from a test match point of view it's going to be a different one no broad at all um, Anderson for one game you've played 140 test matches and I think every single test match you'll have played We'll have had at least one of them in the uh, in the group. What's the summer going to be like? You know, Jimmy's going to be there. He's going to be grumpy for one more five day game, and then he's going to be moving on. Um, what's it going to be like without Broad and Anderson? Well, I say they've been up part of the furniture since I've been involved. Um, it's going to be slightly different. It's going to be very strange. Um, that that final test match for Jimmy is going to be very emotional. Yeah. He's someone I'm quite close with in the team, um, and I've been for a while and. You know, to have the pleasure of watching him operate from slip for such a long period of time has been um, a joy. And yeah, we're gonna surely we're gonna miss him um, for for many many years. But what a career he's had! What a what's uh, what a, what a brilliant player England have been able to watch for such a long period of time. And as I say, his achievements speak for himself. He's absolute legend. So um, it'll be a very special. I hope we can cap it off for him really nicely um and you know he can have the fairy tale ending that that Stuart had last summer which was so fitting for him as well so but yeah with that it does come it does come with opportunities for others and and that's a, obviously an exciting opportunity for to guys to step up and and hopefully I know they're big shoes to fill but go and do it in their own way and show what they can they can bring to the to the team and to the table and um take this team in the direction that Ben and, and Brendan want to to take it and that we all know that we're capable of, of going to. Confirmation, Harmi, that the ECB, are, um, th their advisory team has told them to seek private investment uh, into the teams in the 100. Uh, we know that, um, but confirmation. Let's talk about Bride and Cass. Um, for me, uh, the, the big news story, and I feel um, that he might be very frustrated because he hasn't been able to say anything at all on his own behalf. Uh, obviously, he's been silenced. He's been banned for three months um, for uh, breaching the betting protocol. A number of things to say there. He was given a 16-month ban, actually, um, but 13 months suspended for two years for placing 303 bets, which sounds like a very big number. Um, you know, it sounds like, I mean, that that sounds like a syndicate operation, um, the other thing to mention is that it was seven years ago. It was in 2017 or between 2017 and 2019. Um, so he's banned until the 28th of August. What can you tell us? He's a he's a Durham player. Um, he would have been, uh, or I guess, what, 20? Um, 90, 20, 19 years old, 20 years old. He would have been aware, I'm sure, he would have had a security briefing. He would have been aware that what he was doing was, well, against... Uh, the 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 protocols of being a professional athlete. So, what can you tell us? Yeah, it, it's. I think from I was at the club on Friday um, and when it came out. I've not seen or or, or heard from Bryden. Um, 
he's a lovely kid. He's you know it, whenever you, 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 people talk about the sort of betting and you know there's there's obviously other ways you can get banned. I think sometimes you have to look at it into, into context. And you know Brian was a he was a young lad and he was injured for the whole of I mean for the whole of that time. Brian Cars, well, not the entire 2017 to 2019 period, but for the majority of it, he was injured. There was a, he spent a hell of a lot of time out. The whole of 2017, he spent injured. Um, and I think by all accounts, it's it's like we all do it. We say it, and I'm not condoning it. I'm not not one bit. He's done wrong. He knows. He 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 does. He should have known that you can't bet on cricket. But there's many times you sit in the pub on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday tea time, and the way the betting is now, you can literally you can bet on the next corner, you can bet on the next free kick, you can bet on the next foul, literally everything that comes with it. And I think by all accounts, it's it's been on IPL cricket. It hasn't. It's a little bit of boredom betting, you know, watching watching a, a game of cricket and and try and sort of have some interest in the game. So 303 bets. Sounds a lot, but it's not when over the course of a, a sort of two hour, two and a half, three hour period when you know there's 250 balls or 240 balls in a game of cricket, or officially anyway. So, you know, now you can bet on anything, but like I said, I'm not condoning it. But I would, I would urge people to put it into a little bit of context here. He was a young lad, he was naive, he was injured, and I think it's possibly a little bit of boredom betting. Um, that's that's gone back all the way through, and I think he's known. I think we've known for a while. They've known for a while about it. I think, by all accounts, according to the people I spoke to at Durham, they have, he's he's done nothing but help to make sure. And I think that's proven in you know what's happened to him sixteen months into into three months, which is it's a slap on the wrist. But it will stick with him, won't it? You know, you'll be classed as somebody that's betting. No, have that against your name and that's the unfortunate bit but um, I urge people to put this into a little bit of context that it's not anything that he's played in it's not anything to do with English cricket it's not anything to do with I don't think it's anything to do with any English cricket or Durham cricket and I think because of that I think that's why he's he's only getting a you know what, what looks like a, a you know being you know, just being a little bit of a slap on the wrist so I think a little bit of naivety a little bit of youth a little bit of boredom because of injuries. Um, and unfortunately, it's come out just at the wrong time for him because, yes, he was probably close to the the verge of the England team manners. But what I would say is you can now see that the troubles he's had at the start of the season, possibly this has been playing on his mind. So it's out now. It's done. Hopefully, we can move on from it. He comes back at the back end of August. He can play in the last four championship games for Durham. I hope it doesn't. I don't. I really hope that nothing is held against him moving forward. Um, but let's wait and see. Yeah. Well, whether you double park on a yellow line or do 120 down the M1, they're both traffic violations, aren't they? Yeah. Um, but and of course, it does mean that he'll miss the entire Test series against uh, mm. the West Indies, um, and that in, is uh, certainly punishment uh, enough in itself. You you would have thought. Um, Josh Tung is also obviously missing. So, so you know, one week, Harmi, we talk about the incredible depth of uh, fast bowling in the England ranks, and then the next, you're suddenly looking around going, who is going to bowl? Who is going to bowl quick against the West Indies? It is. That's the, you know, I mean, that's a million-dollar question. You know, I think in white ball cricket, we've been inundated with players for a number of years because the team's been doing well. Red ball cricket... We've had these. This is where we keep going back. You know, people say, "Why was Broad Anderson so great?" It was like because we we're always being able to get picked. We were in a position to get picked every <laughs> single series. You turned up, and you knew if you really wanted to pick, if you wanted to move on from Broad Anderson, you could. But you always came around to the fact that when you're trying to pick six bowlers and look ahead for a series of three, four, five Test matches, you always had to have Broad Anderson in it because. They were the only ones that really were consistently, one, durable enough, two, performance ready, three, I mean, skill levels and performance levels are, are you know, speak for themselves for the volume they played, and their longevity. longevity. So that's why Broad and Anderson were always going to be a huge, 
huge burden to fill and hold to fill because nobody else is nailing it down. You know, hopefully Chris Wokes will come back into play soon. And I think he lost uh, the you know he lost his I think he lost his father in in the last week. So you know we hope and wish you know the Wokes family you know all the very very best and hopefully Chris comes back into connect and contention for when the series starts. Matt Potts, who bowled I thought bowled very well at Durham the other night um in a in a cause where they just didn't get enough runs batting. So Potts will be another one that will probably play the majority of the series because he is durable. Um Dylan Pennington is somebody who I'm hearing is bowling very, very well at this moment in time. Um because you don't want to have you know, you, you can't bring Archer in and you you probably if England get to the latter stage of it, you don't want to risk wood off a off a long haul flight and put him in a test match seven days later. So I think I think the first test match will look as though there's probably one or two newcomers in it. And then Mark Wood will probably come in contention for the second or the third test match. But when people say, Oh, you've got to move on from Broad and Anderson, you've got to move on from Broad and Anderson. It's like, whoa, hold your horses there because you know finding somebody to replace them is one thing in name, getting them to do it on the field or being able to be durable to stay on the field for a long period of time is another thing. And that's why replacing the two greats is going to be, it's going to be one hell of a, one hell of a big job. All right, Harmi, a couple of uh, minutes left and it's on to the final word. And I know that uh, a lot of our listeners uh, who have pushed for time, fast forward the podcast, and go straight to the final word. We've got three more to choose from this week. Uh, there's, uh, a lot of people would have seen this on social media. Checkley Cricket Club bowling out Wedgwood Cricket Club for, for eight and chasing down the target of one legal delivery. Um, you can find that on uh, social media, on on Twitter. It's <laughs> one of the great club cricket stories. Um, we're also hoping to have Frank and Subaga on the show next week. We might just have a, a couple of minutes with him. We're trying to set up an interview with him. He's the oldest player. In T20 World Cup history, Uganda um, qualifying for this tournament ahead of Zimbabwe, which was a brilliant, unbelievable, unprecedented result for that country where the game is growing. Um, but he's 43 years old. Off spinner, of course he is. What else would he be? Um, uh, so congratulations to him. But that isn't my choice um, of uh, of final word. But I, I, I'll come on to that in a moment, Harmy. Uh, a word about Frank? Still going strong at 43? Yeah. Yeah, we can have him as our final word next week if he comes on and, and gives us a couple of minutes. That'll be that'll be great. And you see, that, I mean, there's been loads of rain around. So, yeah, Chickley Cricket Club, we'll give them a little bit of a benefit of the doubt. There must have been a little bit of dampness and green seamer and the lost the toss on it. Uh, it must have dried out in the middle of the afternoon. So, you know, things can only get better for them. But I think I know where you're going for your final word, and it would be mine as well. I've not seen... Archie for some time because obviously he was well, just let, a little boy. Let, 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 yeah, let me I set the Harmi, let, let me set the, the, the background for that. Yeah, my final word is uh very much um Archie Vaughan, but it's the next generation of the of the great 2005 Ashes team because a, a month ago we spoke about the Flintoff boys. Um Charlie Harmison um gets a, a name check on this show from from time to time. And now Archie Vaughan signing a professional contract with Somerset. It's amazing. Brilliant. It is. It's fantastic. Like I said, I've not seen young Archie for some time now because it was a while. It was a long time ago since me and his old man played cricket together. Um, when the you know, the, the sort of they were in nappies running around the the outfield of many, many international venues. And hopefully they all get a chance to go and play in these international venues that the old men play, the their old men played in. But I think he's done really well down at Millfield School. I think obviously the the Vaughan family have been obviously the education has been a, a big thing. But some he's been at Somerset for a while now, and and hopefully he um he shines he shines through. He need I think in the modern day game he needs to possibly have a little bit more agricultural shot selection than his old man did because Michael was very very correct, and whenever he tried to hit it sort of over the leg side on in the air. Uh, there wasn't much power there in them uh, in them noodle arms, but no, he's um, he looks and looks of the footage I've seen. Archie he looks a, a really, really talented player, and 
Um, fingers crossed, because that's what we want. I mean, going into international, uh, going into county cricket, when you when you have a surname that obviously is recognisable, uh, look, you know, you you, you see what Justin Carey's has been doing slips under the radar because of his dad's great career and Michael Atherton. Um, there are families that decide to do that, but fingers crossed, you know, the, the Vaughan family, the, the Flintoff family, and many other families who have played, you know, first class cricket. I see young um Elam's doing well at at Surrey, Sales is doing well at Northampton. They can emulate their dads because unfortunately for them, the surname is a little bit of some, you know, a little bit of a, a noose around their neck that it doesn't, it, I'm not saying it should hold them back, but everybody's wanting and you know, wondering if they're as good as their dad. They're better than their dad because they're playing a different time than their dad. The game has changed and hopefully they can they can all survive. They can all have a, a great, prosperous career. Um, and it was good to see Archie, you know, finally sign the dotted line in his first professional contract at Sunset. So well done, Archie Vaughan. You've been listening to a following on here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And if you have missed any of the show uh, and you want to catch up, uh, you, you know what to do. You can download the podcast from the following on feed, available via the free TalkSport app or wherever else. Uh, we'll be back at a similar time next week to bring you the latest from the G20 World Cup. But for now, this has been Following On. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.